Okay, class, here we go. See if the Zoom is working tonight. So uh, I believe this is where we left off in class uh, today. This is actually Thursday evening. I'm trying to get a jump on this stuff. Um, so we talked through this slide, and this was just looking at uh, the definition of isentropic uh, efficiency. Um, we see that this, uh, I think I, we talked about this in class, but if this is the inlet condition at the high pressure, uh, so we start out at uh, condition one, and for the isentropic turbine, it's gonna drop straight down at constant entropy to the lower pressure, that would be the exit pressure. And uh, we're showing that to be uh, inside the dome in this particular example, so that uh, there would be some uh, liquid moisture if we do it isentropically. If we do it on a real turbine that has some irreversibility, then the entropy is gonna increase. Uh, we still go to the same pressure because this is an isobar bar that we're showing 50 uh, kilopascals here. And so we would uh, exit the turbine at the same pressure, but increased entropy, and that would leave us in the superheat region for this example, okay? Uh, and if, if, you, if you do the math on it, the change in enthalpy is less for the real turbine than for the uh, isentropic turbine. And that ratio is the isentropic efficiency. Um, let's see. So we, we said this today that uh, in class that the uh, isentropic turbine efficiency is a comparison between a real actual operating turbine and an ideal turbine. So uh, it's just how closely the real turbine can come to ideal performance, which is defined as operating at constant entropy. Um, and, and, and a point to always keep in mind is that um, no matter what pressure we exit the turbine, uh, we still are primarily in the vapor state. There could be a little liquid in there, just depending on the particular point. But even if the pressure is low, we could be uh, 90, 95 percent vapor. That vapor, even though it doesn't have much temperature, uh, still has a lot of energy involved. Uh, and that's the energy that we throw away in a condenser. Uh, whereas in a cogeneration application, we'll come out at a higher pressure and a higher temperature, but uh, we'll use that thermal energy at the exit of the turbine uh, for a productive purpose. Uh, this is uh, our equation for isentropic efficiency. We, we have the same inlet state for the ideal and the actual turbine, but we have different exit states. So you just have to determine your enthalpies and it's pretty easy to calculate. Or if you know an isentropic efficiency, then you can calculate an exit, uh, an actual exit enthalpy. Um, so the major contributors to isentropic efficiency would be the design of the turbine, the control valve type, and the turbine load. Um, we talk a good bit about the different types of control valves in the steam power plants class, but we're not going to go into that uh, in this course very much. Uh, so we'll see that larger um, multi-stage uh, back pressure turbines are going to have a better efficiency than a single stage. If we have a small uh, pressure drop or and a relatively small steam flow rate, then that's going to reduce the number of stages, one, maybe two at most, and the isentropic efficiency will suffer. Uh, larger uh, pressure drops uh, and higher steam flows uh, lead us to multi-stage back pressure turbines uh, that have better isentropic efficiencies. This shows a little bit of the uh, economics. Uh, we see in the first column over here that we've got a fuel cost, uh, dollars per million BTUs from $2 up to 18. And we're going to assume 80% boiler efficiency. 
And so this is then the value or the cost of generating uh, kilowatt hours, or in this case, it's megawatt hours, okay? So to calculate this number, this is $2 a million BTUs. So take $2 and divide by a million, and you get a really small number, and that's the cost to purchase one BTU. And then if you multiply it uh, by 3413, that's the number of BTUs in a kilowatt hour. And then if you multiply it by 1,000, that gets you the number of BTUs in a megawatt hour and then, um, or the cost of it, and then you have to divide by 0.8 because there's the, you have the 20% loss in the boiler and that will generate these numbers. So again, if I take $2 and divide it by a million and then multiply it by 3413 and then multiply it again by a thousand, and then divide by 0.8, the boiler efficiency, you'll see these numbers. And so we see um, that the cost to generate a megawatt hour uh, is not all that much, or the, the value. So uh, $8.5 a megawatt hour, you move the decimal point three places. So to get kilowatt hour, so that's 0 0.0085, that's not even one penny to the cost of generating a megawatt hour or a kilowatt hour, uh, $8.50 per megawatt hour. You know, I mean, uh, a plant could easily have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, six cent uh, kilowatt hour, which would be $60 a megawatt hour. So my goodness, if we have a good gas price, a good fuel price, uh, we can make some money by generating our own electricity. So that's kind of what this is about. Okay, uh, back pressure turbine economics. Let's go on and look through this. Um, so the, 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 we've said this before, I mean, uh, this compares and contrasts. One path would be through the PRV, uh, which means we don't get electricity and then we just satisfy the thermal de demand, but then we have to purchase all the electricity from the power provider. If we go through the back pressure turbine, what we're gonna see is uh, we get electricity. We have to generate a little more steam because we're taking energy out for the electricity and for the generation, uh, but then we can still use uh, almost all of the, or the bulk of the energy coming out of the turbine uh, for the thermal demand and that's why where the economics become really good. Okay, so primary factors uh, impacting the analysis are the impact electrical cost, which means if we use one more kilowatt hour or we generate a kilowatt hour, what's the value of that last one that we, the additional one that we use or the first one that we uh, uh, generate and save that we don't have to purchase from the utility company. And then if we have to purchase a little more fuel for whichever boiler is gonna to respond to the increase in load, uh, that would be the cost of fuel for that boiler would be the impact fuel cost. Uh, boiler efficiency matters, uh, isentropic efficiency of the turbine matters, and the steam demand. How much steam can we put through the turbine? Those are all important parameters. Uh, this is some more definition on impact cost. I think I've defined it pretty well, but we can read the slide. Impact cost, actual economic impact of increasing or decreasing electrical consumption. That would be the electrical impact cost. Uh, we're not really, we really don't want to use uh, the average cost uh, because it's that it's that uh, last kilowatt hour that we're gonna save or that we're gonna have to use another one of, and that's, that's the value that's used to evaluate a project. <clears throat> um, and this last bullet, you guys are experts on, so a thorough understanding of the electric rate structure is essential, and you guys are pretty good. 
I think, right now on understanding the basics of electrical rate structures. Okay, so we've got a steam turbine example. We'll talk through here a little bit. It goes on for a little while. Okay, so example of a turbine slash PRV evaluation. So the idea is we're currently putting steam through a uh, pressure reducing valve, and we would like to take some, if not all of that steam, and put it through a turbine, get some electricity generated, and then use the uh, steam out of the turbine for process uh, thermal energy. So we want to determine the economic incentive associated with operating the turbine generator compared to the pressure reducing valve. Okay, so here's some parameters. Same steam pressure, 400 uh, PSIG and 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Our fuel cost is $10 a million, boiler efficiency 84, operates all the time. Um, so we show two different paths. We can go use the PRV or we can use the turbine. Uh, our electrical price is $70 a megawatt hour. Uh, turbine isentropic efficiency is 32%. And our steam, our nominal steam demand, if we go through the PRV is 30,000 pounds an hour of 20 PSIG steam. And that's about 35 and a half million BTUs an hour of uh, energy that's supplied to the process. Uh, saturated liquid uh, condensate uh, is discharged from the process or the load at atmospheric pressure. And that's what comes back to the, to the boiler, to the steam system. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so the side by side comparison. So the first one we'll do is the PRV. And so you see uh, the numbers, we've added a little bit. We're showing that the, uh, the PRV steam discharge temperature, that's constant enthalpy across the uh, pressure reducing valve, will be 659 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty hot. And so that's the temperature of the steam that's uh, coming into the process. Uh, and it's uh, we're gonna it's gonna require uh, thirty thousand pounds an hour at this entering condition. Again, delivering uh, thirty five point five million BTUs for process use. Okay, so what happens if we uh, don't use the PRV and we go through the steam turbine? Then we see that. Uh, we're gonna, well, we get some power. We don't have a number here, but we'll get some power out of this thing. Notice the steam temperature is now 505. And that's because we're taking energy out of the steam as it flows through the turbine, most of which gets converted to electricity, which is good. So what's gonna happen if we have the same thermal demand, the 35.5 million BTUs an hour, we don't have as much energy in the steam entering. So we're gonna have to generate a little bit more steam to get the same uh, amount of heat to the process. So, okay. Um, this shows uh, a screen from the old uh, steam system assessment tool, the predecessor to the measure program. Measure program has similar uh, options in it. This is where we have turned on a project uh, this would turn on a project, yes, install a turbine. This would be a high pressure to low pressure header turbine. Um, we're calling out the isentropic efficiency at 32%, and we have a fixed steam flow of 32,000. And so that has gone up because we know that the enthalpy uh, of the steam is gonna be less, and so we need a little bit more steam to be able to supply the same uh, amount of heat to the process. Okay, uh, this is what the SSAT screen looked like. Um, it always shows the turbines and you have to look and see if there's no steam into this turbine and no power, then this turbine is turned off. It's not, in, not being simulated in the model. So the, so the condensing turbine's off, this turbine's off, 
Now this turbine is on, the HPMP. Uh, it's generating uh, 3351 kW with 150,000 pounds an hour through it. And then between the medium pressure and low pressure header, uh, we're passing another 150,000 pounds and we're getting about four, uh, 4159 kW, okay? And notice we have up here, we've got uh, 90,000 uh, pounds per hour going through the pressure reducing valve. So this is the case. What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on this turbine and this is the one we're gonna stuff the 32,000 pounds an hour through, and then we'll see the impact on the operating cost from that, okay? So this is where we've turned this on. Uh, we're actually putting 32,100 pounds an hour through it. We're getting uh, 701 kW uh, out of this one, and we didn't know, but this, uh, this one actually goes down, and it's because there's less energy in this header. We see this header because um, is um, receiving, uh, well, let's see, I think it's receiving less energetic steam. Yeah, because you see, in this case, uh, we're uh, 580 degrees Fahrenheit, and this header is 409. In this case, this has gone down to uh, 567 and this to 392. So our total steam production has gone up to 263 from ah, 260.9. So, you know, when we do additional cogen, we have to uh, uh, generate some more steam and it can affect the other turbines that could already be in the system. Okay, at any rate, uh, this is how it kind of all nets out. The power cost, uh, we save uh, 393,000, but we have to spend 258,000 for additional fuel and 3,000 for additional water because we're generating more steam. We net out uh, 642 kW and of course, we're saving 132,000. So we see what happens with the boiler and the fuel type and all of that. So the electrical power purchases decrease, but the fuel increases. Okay, uh, back pressure turbine economics. Uh, we know most industrial systems require thermal energy, uh, not just mass flow. And so that's why we have to generate more steam when we generate more power. We've talked about that before. Um, I think we've covered this slide pretty well in the past. Now, we could say, golly, what if, uh, if this was a larger turbine, uh, perhaps I could find one with a better isentropic efficiency just to see the impact on the numbers. Uh, we rerun with a 70% isentropic efficiency and now that 701 jumps up to 1533, which is uh, pretty impressive, pretty impressive uh, increase. Uh, steam generation jumps up again uh, a little bit, so the fuel cost is going up. Uh, and let's see. So what do we, so this is how it all kind of shakes out. We get 907,000 in additional um, in reduction in purchase power cost, we have to spend 591,000 for fuel and additional 8,000 for water. So we net out 309,000, not bad. And on the power gen, we net out uh, uh, 1479 kW. So that's a 9.9% increase. So, you know, that's uh, depending on the cost of the unit, um, it could be a good project. <clears throat> okay, so let's play some more. So we'll go back to the original example where we get the 642 kW netting out. But what if the fuel cost was $15 a 
a million, really pretty steep, instead of $10 a million, uh, the cost of electricity is kept the same. And so we see all of a sudden that the additional cost almost balances the uh, reduction in power purchase and we save $2,000 a year. So this cogen is really a play between what's the uh, basic cost of electricity versus uh, the fuel, in this case, natural gas. If the gas is cheap and the power is expensive, then this is gonna be a tremendous idea. If the price of electricity is not too bad and gas is expensive, then it's a terrible idea and it won't save you any money. Uh, <clears throat> so let's see. So now uh, we're going to go back to the original case with the $10 gas, but we're going to increase the electrical price from $70 a megawatt hour to $100 a megawatt hour. And you see all of a sudden, I think it was from $132,000, now we're saving $300,000. So the fuel and water cost. Uh, increase of the same, but now the electricity saved is worth uh, 562,000. So that nets out 300,000. So again, it's a play on the uh, the difference in the power cost and the fuel cost, sometimes called the spark spread. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so let's see what happens if uh, instead of increasing the electrical cost, we decrease it to uh, $40 a megawatt hour and keep the fuel price at $10, and all of a sudden we see we're losing $37,000. So you definitely wouldn't want to do this where gas is expensive and electricity is cheap. So this kind of summarizes uh, the different cases that we've talked about. Uh, Basically, we ran 32% isentropic efficiency, except for the second case, just to see, and we see what a big impact that has. And then you can see as the, uh, as we change the electrical cost, well, we in the first three, we keep the electrical cost, and we, uh, between the first and the third, we jump the fuel price, and then for the last two, we go back to the original fuel price, and increase and decrease the electrical price. So I think you're probably getting a pretty good, pretty good feel for this. Uh, condensing turbines, this is what the power plant does. Uh, and, you know, we pull down to a really low pressure here. TVA is one to two PSIA, depending on time of year and how well the condenser's working. And again, we've got a lot of energy coming out of this turbine that we just throw away. Uh, primary factors influencing condensing turbine operations are, again, the power price, what do you have to pay for electricity, what do you have to pay for fuel, how efficient is the turbine, and then the boiler efficiency and the turbine discharge pressure. Those are the uh, parameters, the first three being probably a little more influential in the analysis. So let's let's put 100 units of thermal energy into a condensing turbine. And this is uh, in this based on the isentropic efficiency here of 80%, we're going to get 27 units of shaft energy out, which we could couple to a pump or an air compressor or a turbine and that leaves 73 units to be thrown away in the condenser. So with a condenser pressure of 1.4 PSIA. Uh, this shows uh, a comparison of uh, the performance. Again, the impact power cost we see uh, for different iso turbine isentropic efficiencies and different fuel costs. So if you've got uh, $10 fuel cost and a 40% isentropic efficiency. Uh, this is almost 28 cents a kilowatt hour. You can't afford to do that. So these prices, unless you have really cheap fuel and a, a pretty darn efficient turbine, you're not going to be able to afford 
to do this. You don't see many condensing turbines in industry. Most of the time, uh, they don't make economic sense. It's hard to compete with a power company. Okay, um, there's some, a little more information on uh, condensing turbines and turbines in general are subject to all of that first list of things, blade deposits, uh, blade erosion, seal wear, wet steam, and throttling uh, are all losses. Uh, efficiency improvements can be had by uh, replacing blades. They could be uh, uh, eroded and the blade profiles uh, messed up by erosion, or it could be that the manufacturers come out with some better, a better blade design that will get you more power. Uh, improved seals, uh, keep steam from leaking along the, the shaft. Uh, that can be an issue. Uh, you can certainly replace a turbine sometimes and get enough efficiency to make it pay. And uh, the load uh, has an impact on the efficiency as well. Uh, these are pictures from uh, Jamalco. This is uh, a big cogen operation in Jamaica. Uh, it was a bauxite refinery too. This was uh, owned by Alcoa Aluminum. Uh, and they had uh, silica in the water and the silica would carry over in the steam and form these uh, deposits, terrible deposits on the back of the blade. And every four to five years, this thing had to be taken apart and basically steam cleaned, uh, sandblasted to get this stuff off of there because that's uh, sil silica buildup. And it would destroy the uh, aerodynamics of the blade. And this was, I think, a 32, 35 megawatt unit. And it would slowly deteriorate until it got down to maybe, uh, when it got down someplace around 20, or in the high teens, it was just too much of a deterioration. And they would have to come offline for at least a month, one to two months, and uh, take this thing all apart and have it cleaned. Uh, let's see, uh, oh, condenser pressure. Uh, if we have back pressure buildup at the discharge, that will reduce the amount of power generated. Uh, we can get non-condensable gases down here, nitrogen or carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, that sort of thing. And that has to be vented from the condenser. They have uh, non-condensable uh, vent systems and vacuum pumps to pull that stuff out of there. Uh, the heat transfer surfaces can become fouled and so you can't condense the steam as effectively and the back pressure goes up. Uh, if you can somehow get colder water, uh, you'll make this work better. Uh, or if uh, sometimes the pumps are not good and the uh, condenser water flow uh, becomes less than optimal, and that can be a problem as well. Okay, and so I think that's good. I'm gonna uh, end this uh, recording here and uh, post it on YouTube, and uh, I'll come back in a day or so um, with another one. So hope you're having a good evening or whenever you're watching this, and uh, be looking for another email shortly. Good night.